Well, hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Gospel Simplicity. Today I am joined by Father Joshua Caswell, and this is going to be really fun. Many of you might have seen my video in which I came here and had no idea what I was doing. Well, today we are back for a tour of this incredible church, and you are going to get some great insight from Father Joshua. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I'm Father Joshua Caswell, and I'm the pastor of St. John Cantus Church, and I'm very happy to take Austin and all the viewers of Gospel Simplicity on a tour of St. John Cantus Church, arguably one of the most sacred spaces in the city of Chicago. So this will be fun. Uh, hopefully there'll be some great questions and insights as we head in and see a look into a uh, beautifully appointed Catholic Church. Here we are in the vestibule of the church. Uh, most Catholic churches are actually built on the plan of the Jewish temple. So whether you have the outer court, mm -hmm. you have the inner court, you have the sanctuary, you have the Holy of Holies, there's okay. all these levels. And so we're in the outer level. We've just come up the steps and about to enter through these front doors of the, of the church into the actual space itself. The three doors here uh, in our church do represent the three mystical doors to heaven in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much symbolism. Everything in this church contains symbolism. It would take hours, but today we're just going to taste some of that and see some of the beautiful symbols and how they speak to us, teach us the faith, and bring us closer to God. So let's go ahead and awesome. step on in. One of the first things you see, besides the beauty behind you, is the um, beautiful medallion on the floor. This medallion is important as we walk across the threshold into the sacred space. It's actually taken from the Bridge of the Angels in Rome. Mm. So when you uh, would cross in Rome at a time of pilgrimage from profane Rome to sacred Rome, across the Bridge of the Angels, you would see the same inscription. And in, it's in Latin. It says, from this point is a welcome for the humble, from this point is retribution for the proud. And so it's showing the kind of attitude we need when entering a sacred space. So let's go ahead and go on and see the inside of the church. And I have to say, the first time I ever came in here, the first reaction is just, wow. And I mean, it, it silences you seeing it all. It, it's incredible. This space should overwhelm us. I've seen the reactions so many times. I've been here for 17 years and seen people's various reactions to the church. And it's usually, oh, the breath in, or wow, or OMG, uh, which is actually appropriate in this, in this case. Uh, but the, the space should overwhelm us because churches are built to look like heaven, or at least what we think heaven would look like. And so um, seeing the space as heaven, St. Augustine told us that we make churches beautiful because they should remind us of heaven. And so um, that's what we, we see here before us is a, some sort of resemblance of heaven. I, I think you guys nailed it. I've never been to heaven, but... <laughs> You guys, uh, it, it's beautiful. One of the first things people comment on is this beautiful hardwood floor. There are 17 various hardwoods from around the world and these beautiful medallions. We're gonna walk down the floor and we're gonna see um, step by step these beautiful medallions and the symbols they contain. We'll say a bit more about the architecture and tell the story of the church going forward. So come on in. As we walk down the floor, one of the first things you're gonna see is these symbols which are symbols of the life of Christ. The floor is, is new, and instead of just replacing it with regular tile, we thought, why not make the floor also teachable? So wow. it teaches people about the whole story of Christ. Hmm. And so the very first medallion you see here, you can see ebony, purple heart, bird's eye maple. There's 17 different woods that are harder than oak on this floor, no stain whatsoever. But of course you see, very familiar, the Star of David. Mm -hmm. It's the Jewish star, but in the center, there are two Greek letters, and in any Catholic church or in Catholic symbology, you're going to see the, what's called the chi rho. Chi for this letter, the X, and rho for the letter rho in Greek. So the okay. chi rho are the first two letters of Christos, okay. and so it's Christ. And so that's a symbol of Christ who is born from the promise, born from the star of David, born into that heritage. So that's the symbol for, for Christ. So let's go ahead and walk down wow. again to the next one. As we're walking down the floor again, getting more into this beautiful sacred space, uh, you can see these three symbols of the crowns. There are three crowns. Now, of course, most would take that well. Of course, the three magi came and presented gifts to Jesus. But the three crowns are really about our mission in the world as Christians through our baptism, that we are priest, prophet, and king. Hmm. And Christ was all, of course, all three of those par excellence. He was priest, 
He was prophet, he was king. By these three crowns, it's our mission to b both sanctify, to teach, and to govern in our own way. Those are the three gifts of the church. So basically, Christ promised him as the Messiah bringing these three gifts. Wow, just the theology that's embedded into the floor is incredible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I've heard of non-denominational churches having committee meetings about the color of carpet, but I don't think it had to do with theology. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right now. It's, um, one of, our, one of the parishioners actually many years ago had the design for the floor and worked it out with, with a pastor and it was just seen as a way to teach people. Wow. And I'm not sure if you noticed this, but we're actually heading downhill. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. Um, it was one of the first churches in Chicago to be built on a slight incline and it just goes slightly down that everyone can see the altar. So as we head down, we're actually going downhill. This hmm. beautiful medallion here, you can see what's called the instruments of the passion. So you're gonna see the crown of thorns, the nails, the spear, the sponge, the hammer. It's basically a symbol of the passion, of Christ's passion. Wow. So not only are these medallions a symbol for Christ, but for every Christian. Every Christian must go through this floor. Every Christian must walk through this destiny. We are first, of course, born as a promise, baptized, we're given the call as priest, prophet, and king. And then finally, we of course have to go through our own death, like Paul says, right? I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Yeah. But of course, that's not the end of the story. So we head to the next symbol. The next symbol on the, on the floor here is in Latin, it's called the Vexilla Regis. It's a fancy way of saying the king's banner. Okay. This banner is a symbol of the resurrection, a symbol of the victory over death and sin. It's not only here. If you look up way in the apps now, if you've seen the gold apps, do you see the image of Christ? Yeah. And he's carrying the same banner. And so his, his death brought victory. And so he carries the standard as the victory over death and sin. This wow. incidentally is also the image of the symbol of the religious order that staffed this church for 100 years, the resurrectionists. They were devoted to the resurrection. Oh, wow. So, okay. And then finally, the last medallion, which we will see in a bit, is the eight-pointed star, eight points symbolizing eternity whether it was the baptistry of Constantine, whether the early baptistries, always eight sides, symbolizing eternal life, right? Because seven is completion, eight is that eternal. Wow. And so these, this eight-pointed star, one of the most beautiful things for me to see as a pastor is when there is a funeral here and you see the coffin being brought down the floor of the church. Mm. And so the body of the person who died goes through all of these medallions and finally rests here on this eight-pointed star of eternal life. Wow. But in some, the, the rich theology of bringing us into the space. So here we are, uh, now we can take a look around, around us at this magnificent space. It is overwhelming, it's enormous. The church seats about 1,500 people. Wow. Um, the church is, um, you know, it, it does overwhelm us with its space and architecture. Churches are built to give us a sense of there's something bigger than ourselves. In yeah. the last 40 years in Catholicism, there was a tendency to build churches that looked more like Pizza Hut. <laughs> and we've discovered that human nature doesn't want churches like Pizza Hut. They want churches that are beautiful and real, like the cathedral in Chartres or Notre Dame, or they want, they really connect to that because the human uh, spirit longs for something bigger than itself. Mm -hmm. So here we are in this busy city, but people come in and this space helps them to feel their aspirations toward heaven. And so whether it's like you're in the Grand Canyon or you're seeing a sunset, it's the same thing as that moment of beauty allows you to experience something greater than yourself. And so many people come here on Sundays, many who are not necessarily Catholic or even uh, Christian of any sort, maybe they're atheists, but they come here because the space allows them to know that they have a deeper aspiration. You look around us, you see the beautiful stained glass windows. You can see this window here, which is actually uh, remarkable. It has eight images, but it is the window of the seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. At the very base, you can see St. Peter. And uh, Peter and Christ in that moment, you are Peter and I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then if you go in clockwise order, you can see baptism, confirmation, uh, Holy Eucharist, confession, matrimony, last rites, and finally matrimony. Sorry, it was uh, holy orders and matrimony. But yes, the seven sacraments there, of course, with the basis of Christ establishing the, the church. So. Um, there's a lot of things we could focus on, but one of the things we'll you definitely see before you is this magnificent altar. So let's go ahead and see this beautiful altar. Feel free to ask any questions at any time. Yeah, this is, it's stunning. And thank you so much. I feel like 
We've gotten a whole theology course just in walking down the aisle. The, and, whole, the whole life of Christ. The whole yeah. life of Christ. And I will say, you know, you made the comment about people wanting a space like this. Having been here on a Sunday morning, I, I can vouch that this place is full on a Sunday, which, which is beautiful to see. And like you said, it's in, I mean, we are right downtown right now. So it, it's really neat to see that. I mean, try to keep this church open as much as possible, that people who are weighed down by the cares of the world can have a space to come and, and to pray. So I mentioned that all the churches being like on a plan of a Jewish temple. Mm -hmm. See, we had the outer court. We're in the inner court now. So we've just arrived at the sanctuary, and the sanctuary is a place of tremendous beauty. Um, and of course, it's where the holy sacrifice of the Mass happens. Um, you can see this, this rail, which is, um, it looks like a dividing line, but of course it's that connecting line which brings us to Christ. Um, and these, these gates, which are open for, for divine liturgy, the procession walks through the gates. And, okay. Mm -hmm. And now, now what's, what's going on here with the gates? Is this, so you said it's not a dividing line, but they're following the temple imagery. Not just anyone could go into the Holy of Holies. How, how does that function here? Right, in some ways, the priest and the sacred ministers, so the priest okay. and the servers. And so it's like, you know we, know, we have someone who goes into the Holy of Holies on our behalf, and so the priest in a procession enters through, through this gate okay. and goes and offers the holy sacrifice of, of the Mass. And it's also the same gate where graces flow back through us, Interesting. whether through the blessings of the church or the priest leaving, you know, at the end of Mass, the Mass has ended and the blessings go out in some way. And so the same thing, too, on this communion rail. People come to receive Holy Communion uh, that is consecrated on this altar. Right. So, um, one of the things you might not see uh, in this church, which you would see at most Catholic churches, is a table altar. At this church, we haven't had a table altar in years. All of our masses, including the English mass and the Latin masses, are said facing, as we mentioned, toward the east. Right. Is that so. ad orientum? Ad orientum. Just trying to get a couple exactly. bonus points to the show. I, I, I read the comments, guys. <laughs> ad orientum mass is, is being offered. And... Uh, the Ad Orientum Mass, of course, we are facing toward the east because the sun rises in the east. Right. And so every, every, every morning the sun rising, and of course that's symboled by the beauty of the yeah. res resurrection. Wow. Um, on the altar, you're going to see relics. Uh, we have a lot of relics, and I'm not sure if you have time to see them today, but they, they are here. But the relics on the altar, you've got St. John Cantius, St. Anne, St. Stanislaus, St. Dominic, St. Hyacinth. And so there are patron saints, sort of okay. Polish patrons of the parish. Um, one of the beautiful images that I do want to point out, because it really shows what goes on at the altar, is there is a bird above the tabernacle. Okay. So if you look above the altar, there's a cross, but there's actually a gold leaf bird. Yes, a little okay. hard to see, but that bird is a pelican. Now, why would you have a pelican there? You anticipated my question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Pelicans are not, they're, na they're sort of nasty birds in a way. But you normally have an eagle or a phoenix, right? Those are symbols of Christ or John. Mm -hmm. But a pelican for a long time was seen in Catholic symbology as an image of Christ. Because when the mother, there was a legend that when the mother pelican uh, was in a time of famine and didn't have food for her chicks or for her young, the mother pelican would pierce her own flesh and feed her blood to her young wow. in order to keep them alive. Okay, yeah, so the, the symbol so is the right So the symbol there. of Christ, what he does for us at this altar, is he gives us his own flesh to eat. He gives us his own very body and blood, that by his sacrifice, he gives us the Holy Eucharist. And so okay. the symbol of the pelican, even Thomas Aquinas has said, O pie pelicana Jesu, O loving pelican Jesus, in his great hymn wow. to the sacred Eucharist. So. And so, right, so below that, you've got the cross, and then you refer to that as the tabernacle, is that correct? That's right. The most important thing in the Catholic Church is the tabernacle, and it's a steel box, often made of precious metals. Okay. And in the tabernacle, you have um, the sacred host. And so the sacred host, of course, is the consecrated bread from the Mass, okay. which Catholics believe becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And so it's the most precious thing we have. And so, yes, we're in the sanctuary and the very Holy of Holies itself, where the sacred elements are stored. And that's why at a Catholic Church, when you come in, you're going to see a lamp. In this case, we have two angels holding lamps. Okay. Uh, in most Catholic churches, it's a red light. It's a symbol of the presence of Jesus. And so the sanctuary lamp shows us that Christ dwells therein. That's why when Catholics walk by churches, they make the sign of the cross, okay. or they would take off their hat, 
or during the day people will come in and visit and our doors are open because they want to visit uh, Christ in the tabernacle okay. uh, in the way that he's made himself available to us. So. And is that the same reason why people would come in and kneel before they go into their Exactly. Okay. So yeah, I, I'm sure you've seen this when the Catholic Church people come in the pew and you're going to see what's called a genuflection. Okay. It's the, it's the one knee genuflection and they get up. That's a symbol of reverence toward Christ in the, in the, in the sacrament. So when we go to other altars, you're not going to see a genuflection. People may bow to a sacred image, but to Christ in the tabernacle, it's a genuflection. Wow. Yeah. And so there's also this painting right above the altar there. What, what do we have going on there? Sure. So the painting above the altar is actually the patron of our parish, St. John Cantius, for whom the church is named. Now, even, even Catholics who may be watching Gospel Simplicity probably don't know who St. John Cantius is. He's one of the most obscure saints. We've heard of St. Francis, St. Dominic, St. Augustine, you know, but St. John Cantius is more obscure. But in Poland, uh, he was well known. He was the professor of the Jagiellonian University. Hmm. It's an amazing uh, university in Europe. Okay. Uh, St. John Cantus was a professor there, and he taught Nicholas Copernicus, and um, was an amazing professor, known for his book smarts. But in that painting, uh, St. John Cantus is seen in what's known as the image of the miracle of the jug. And what happened is that young girl is walking across the world's largest public square, and in a time of economic disparity, She's walking along to sell milk at the marketplace. She trips on the cobblestones. I've been there myself. I've probably tripped on the same stones. They're very <laughs> uneven. She trips on the cobblestones, and the pieces of the jug go everywhere, and the milk spills out, and she's having one of these terrible days. And Father John walks up to her and takes one look at her and you know, basically says, don't cry over spilled milk. <laughs> That's not what he says, but we know what he does. What he does is he picks up the pieces of the jug, and he restores it completely. Wow. And that jug is put back together. Then he says to the girl, go to the river behind that church, the river behind that beautiful church, which is a real church in Europe, St. Mary's Basilica, go behind the church, the Vistula River, and get some water. She brings the water back to him. Father John blesses the water in the jug, and the jug of water turns to rich sweet milk. Wow. So that miracle is at the very core of the gospel of what, we, of what we do here. Yeah. It's about restoring what is, what is broken. Not only uh, a church, like this church was broken. We went from 20,000 parishioners to, in 1988, 40 people for one mass on Sunday, and the church was falling apart. Wow. But through just doing the liturgy well, through the worship of God, people started coming, and the place was again filled with the beauty and the grace of sacred music. So the jug is an analogy, but not only an analogy for churches, but an analogy for each one of us, hmm. that we, by our baptism, are like that vessel holding God's grace. We're holding the, the, the milk of God's grace, but through sin or for whatever reason, brokenness, who knows what, we fall and the jug breaks and the, and the grace leaks out. But God's promise is that he can put us back together and even more, he will fill us and cleanse us with water and of course, then put the richness and the sweetness, a greater and richer milk than was there before. Wow. And so actually one of my favorite things in the sacred liturgy happens on Easter night in this church okay. from this pulpit. Uh, the deacon singing the, what's called the exalted. It's a great hymn of praise for Easter night. And it says, O Felix culpa, O happy fault, O necessary sin of Adam, which merited for us so great a redeemer. Wow. That there's no, there's no fault which can't be re repaired, can't be restored. That's wonderful. And so that image of the broken jug is like there is nothing that's broken that can't be repaired or made greater. And so the religious community that's founded here, of which I am the superior, is dedicated to restoring the sacred through the beauty of the liturgy, through the Holy Mass, through the worship of God, because we want to put people back together, whether it's through um, the 700 confessions we hear on Sunday, and now confessions, confessions, a whole different thing. We'll talk about that. 700 confessions each Sunday are heard at this church. People wow. who are coming in who are broken but able to experience the newness and richness of God's grace through that great sacrament. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I remember being here and seeing the lines for confession, but I had no idea it was that many. I'll tell you one day we had a visitor here and they said, who are all the protesters? And I said, what do you mean protesters? They said, yeah, all the people standing up in the church. 
and they were just people in line for confession. Wow. Because people want to people want to let go. They want to be honest with themselves. Yeah. We'll talk about confession in a, in a bit on our on our way. Yeah. Somewhere. But well, but this is this is the sanctuary. This is the beautiful high altar, and it's beautiful. It it shows to us the, an image in some way of nobility, majesty, and grace. That God is great. He is grand, and that we worship in a, in, in a fitting way. Wow. So now, what I would love to show you is the other places of the church, but let's walk over to our high pulpit. Okay. This is actually pretty amazing. It's not only beautiful, it's actually practical. Uh, this is, of course, a beautiful quarter sun oak pulpit, but it's, it was made in such a way before there were microphones that a preacher could speak to wow. almost 2,000 people in, in a church. So the shell above you can see the symbol of the Holy Spirit. There's the dove yes. um, that the, the preacher would preach and that would reflect the sound onto the congregation below. And so it was a practical thing wow. before there was sound amplification. That, so That's really neat. Imagine what was church like for the first 1900 years, right? Without uh, sound ampl amplification. Yeah. No sound boards with that. So. Wow. Now we are heading to walk in here we are heading to what's called known as our lady's altar or mary's altar okay most churches are going to have not only your main altar but side shrines to various saints and devotions and this side altar is dedicated to mary okay and it contains a very famous icon of mary an icon is not something that you have on your app or something oh. but <laughs> an icon is a window Okay. So we have statues. You see, we have the statues on either side, but an icon is a window through which we look at Mary and she looks at us, or we look at our okay. Lord and they look at us. So it's, it's a window into heaven in a way. The, uh, this would not be a Polish church if we did not have an icon of something known as the Black Madonna okay. or Our Lady of Częstochowa. Okay. And most Polish churches have this image of Mary because there's a very famous one in Poland that even legend says was painted by St. Luke on the family of the, uh, of the table of the Holy Family. It's a long story, a lot of tangents, but wow. Our Lady of Częstochowa, this is a copy of that. Now, this icon is the spiritual heart of the parish in some ways because after Mass on Sunday, you will see people gathered all around here and they are coming here to bring their joys and sorrows in some way to their mother, the mother of, of Jesus. And I will say, as somebody who was formerly Pentecostal, and struggling with uh, Marian devotion, it was sort of like, this would be like the exact opposite. You have Mary covered in silver and gold with lots of jewels in her crowns. But I will tell you my own, I have a, my own experience of, of seeing Mary was just as simple as seeing um, the moon. The moon is beautiful when you go outside because it reflects the sun. Hmm. And so Mary is beautiful because she reflects her son. That all the light in Mary never takes away from her son Jesus. That if we're looking for Jesus, who else better to find her than, than Mary? Wow. And so my own experience with, with Mary. But this particular image was cleaned. These crowns, beautiful crowns, they were made from jewels donated by parishioners. And so if you look at the collar on Jesus' neck, a Versace bracelet from uh, Michigan Avenue, the very tippy top of Mary's crown, a wedding ring from somebody married in the parish. So these crowns were taken to Rome, blessed by John Paul II. And he, he in a private mass, blessed the crowns and called this image Matka Boska de Chicago, meaning Our Lady of Chicago. Wow. And so it's just been a, a really a center of, you know, every bride who is married leaves her flowers here. Every soldier who goes to war leaves their sword or their hat. It's sort of like a prayer. And you're going to see that in most churches. You're going to see the, the altar, but there'll always be a devotional side shrine to Mary. Okay. If you want to connect with that, that maternal side, Mary who represents in some way the beautiful maternal love of, of, of God for us, how, you know, we can get into Mary, but there's, there's, there's a lot there, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And so when you say it's an altar, would you serve Mass there as well? Is yes. that what makes it? Okay. Exactly. In fact, most old churches hold a lot of altars because priests didn't say Mass together. They said their own individual Masses. Right. And so sometimes, like on Christmas or All Souls Day, you'll see the priests saying Mass at all our various altars in, in, in our church. Wow. So, yes, I have said Mass at this altar. In fact, my very first Mass, I said at this altar. Really? Wow. I'm sure that's a uh, powerful memory. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Let's head in now and see this beautiful relic chapel. Yes. One of the things you don't see very often in Catholic churches are relics. And relics are, of course, pieces of the saints, of their very bones. There's different types of relics. There's 
first class relics, which are an actual piece of hair or bone of a saint, okay. second class, which is their clothing, and okay. third class, which are things touched to sacred relics. Wow. These are as old as, as the church now, from the wow. very beginning, you know, uh, in the catacombs. The Christians would go into the um, amphitheater or the Colosseum and rescue the bones of the martyrs, yeah. and they would preserve them, and they would actually pray in the catacombs where the, where the bones of the saints are buried. In fact, every altar, the altar stone has relics in the altar hmm. because the first masses were set upon the tombs of the saints. Wow. But these relics, you have everything from a small bit of the blood of St. Januarius, the glove of Padre Pio, you've got the you know, a tongue of St. John Nepomuk. You have, a tongue? Exactly, a tongue. You have uh, small finger bones. You've got apostles, saints. This church houses 2,000 relics. Wow. And on Saints Day, these are put all around the altars. And in the Catholic Church, we of course believe in the communion of saints, that we are not alone, that those who have gone before us uh, who are in heaven are part of the communion of saints. And I was struggling myself to figure out, you know, why relics are so important or why we should have them. But I'll tell you, I had a story um, after the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. Okay. In 19, it was, uh, no, it was 100 years since like 1908. So it was right. 2006, 16. You had 5 million people downtown in Chicago. And um, in that moment, I remember seeing, I was on one of the L stops and I picked up a piece of blue confetti. I said, this is not going to happen again. The Cubs won't win the World Series for a long time. <laughs> so I wanted a piece of that, of that victory that the Cubs had won. And at that moment, an older gentleman took it from me because he wanted it. And it was just, he snatched it out of my hand. I said, why is this so precious? It's a piece of paper. But in some ways, everyone wants a piece of the victory, a piece of the glory. Hmm. Relics, in some ways, are a piece of the glory. Wow. Those okay. saints who overcame sin and death, who were able, who were martyred for the name of Jesus. So many beautiful relics. You'll have to do another video all about relics. Yeah. And I'm sure you have lots, lots of comments. So. Oh, man. <laughs> You've got a jawbone of virgin martyrs. You've got all kinds of pieces, whole relics. In fact, we even have an entire body of a saint. Um, you have a, a body here? <laughs> there's an entire body of a saint. I'm going to pull out my little flashlight here and show you. This is Saint Simplicius. He is a martyr from the second century, and he was killed under Diocletian. Okay, with the name yeah. of Jesus on, on his lips. So if you look, look, look down, you can actually see through the window the actual uh, skull and the place where he was bludgeoned to death for the name of Jesus. So an actual, the entire bones of St. Simplicius Martyr. Wow, from the second century. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Now I have to ask, when we just walked through there, you just dipped your hand in that thing. What, what, what just happened? <laughs> that was a holy water. Okay. And so most Catholic churches have a holy water font. And um, it's a habit I have. And it's a habit most, most Catholics have. So I dip my finger into the holy water. In fact, I'll show you. I'll, I'll do it here with the camera. So yes, you go like this and you make the sign of the cross with the water, blessing yourself. Why would you do that? Well. In some ways, you're reminding yourself of your baptism. So when you were baptized, water is poured over you, and that's a small way of renewing your baptismal promises. Yes, I belong to God, hmm. but holy water through the centuries has long been known for its effects, uh, keep disease away, ward off evil spirits. It's as old, one of the oldest sacramentals we have. The early Christians were blessing water and using it, sprinkling things with water. It's a way of purifying, and so it's just a, a way of saying, like, it could be, you know, forgive me for whatever sins I've committed, or renewing your baptismal promises, reminding yourself of faith, being faithful to God. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, let's go ahead and walk uh, along this side here. In a, one of the things you're going to see in a Catholic church are votive candles. And these are ways of expressing a prayer. So people come and they want to make a prayer. You know, in the, in the early church, you would, make, you would burn olive oil, you'd make an offering, or you'd make, a, it's in some ways, it's a small sacrifice. So people put a little dollar in the candle box, and they would say a prayer, either to Jesus or to Mary, and then they would light, um, they actually light a candle. And it's a way of the prayer being there, burning in the presence of Jesus. So you, you're not here, but the light is there. And also a symbol of that Christ, of course, is the light. So I've just lit this candle 
uh, for the intention of all the viewers of Gospel Simplicity. Thank and you. so that's our little prayer before uh, Our Lady's altar here, just praying for all of you that you be kept safe and be held truly by Christ and His Mother. So, Thank you. Art, art in the Catholic Church is uh, extraordinarily important. Um, it helps us to, you know, not just, you know, the faith is just not meant to be known. The, the Mass shouldn't be a cerebral thing. It shouldn't be just mm -hmm. like intellectual. And so our entire being is caught up into the emotions of, of basically of worshiping God. And so when Christians come by and they're able to see the beauty of Christ in form, this carved sculpture, this is what's known as a pieta. You've heard of Michelangelo's pieta. This is a pieta like that. It's just Mary holding the dead body of her son Jesus. So that, that, that beautiful moment. Uh, and so it's expressed here in beautiful, beautiful art, like many wow. things in this church. Yes, it really is a, a full body experience versus just getting a couple ideas mm -hmm. in your head at the end of a service. It's really communicating with all of your senses. One of the greatest things about walking into a Catholic church is that all the senses are fully engaged. And so it's never just going to be an experience of, of words because the truth is not just known, but the truth is also loved. And so all of the artwork in the church, um, it should really, the whole, it's a, because Christ became flesh, the Word became flesh. What does John say? The Word that we have touched, that we have yes. felt. There's a certain tangibility to the Catholic faith. So when you walk in a Catholic church, especially this church on a Sunday, you're going to see the architecture, you're going to smell the incense, you're going to hear the music. You're going to, um, you're going to walk up to the rail. And if you're in good standing with the Catholic Church, then you will receive and actually taste the elements, mm. uh, the elements of the body and blood of Jesus. So all the senses are brought into this whole moment. And so that's one of the things you're going to see in a, in a Catholic Church is they take the incarnation seriously, yeah. that, that the Word became flesh. And so that's why you have many beautiful works, works of art. Yes. In the Church, you have uh, so many devotional images and here is one of them so there are different images of Christ or ways of expressing who Christ is this is an image known as the divine mercy it's actually a new painting and it was painted by somebody who had a conversion and was actually baptized at this baptismal font oh, in the wow. last couple of years this is a mm -hmm. baptismal font this is a baptismal font look at that <laughs> there's all kinds of things yeah <laughs> let's take a look let's open that that up oh wow so there's the baptismal font it's got water in it and when a child is brought here, this is where their whole Christian life begins. The water is poured over them, and they experience, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And from that moment on, they, 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 it's the gateway to all the sacraments. So it's the beginning of the Christian life. Okay. So, wow. You know, whether a child or, or an adult. I can imagine there must be so many questions we could be talking oh, about. Oh, there really are. It's, yeah, the beautiful so side shrine image of the Divine Mercy. Uh, the artwork never stops. There's statues everywhere in, in this church. But the image of the Divine Mercy is actually, I would say, it's a modern devotion in terms of um, it was revealed to a nun in 1927, okay. where Jesus revealed these two rays of blood and water flowing from his side. Mm. And it was, about, it was about his mercy, which wants to envelop the world. And so we asked that this image be painted. And John Paul II actually approved this, this image. And the church is celebrating Divine Mercy. The devotion spread all over the, the Catholic Church. But it's just an image to the mercy of God, which is so great that even the greatest sinner has the most right to his mercy. Okay. And so sort of the two streams, the red and the white, symbolize the blood and water which flowed from the open heart of Jesus. Right. So. Wow. And is that connected to the Divine Mercy Chaplet? Someone was telling exactly. me, if you don't want to play, pray the rosary, you should try. The Divine Mercy Chaplet, exactly. Okay. And that's, that Divine Mercy Chaplet, again, is another way of reminding all prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Daddy, remember what your son did, did for us. The Divine Mercy wow. Chaplet goes like, like this. Uh, Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your son Jesus in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. So you're reminding the Father of yeah. what his son did. It's a way of just repeating that again, of thinking of what Christ did for us and reminding, reminding God what Christ did, did for us. Wow, so. interesting. One of the most charming things about this church in particular, as I mentioned, it was built by Polish immigrants. Yes. Um, if you look up in the apps, way up top there around the grate, you're going to see symbols for the four evangelists. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see their, their names there. So you see it's the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospel writers. Each of the four gospel writers have a symbol. 
Okay. And so there's the ox, there's the lion, there's the man, and there, there's the angel, and then there's the eagle for, for John. Okay. But to show the simple faith of the people who built this church, when you look up, you'll see that they actually did them wrong. If you look at <laughs> St. Luke, so it's, it's in Latin, St. Luke, mm -hmm. and just below him, it's not the symbol of the ox as expected. It's the symbol of the lion. So these, uh, these people who built the church, even with the, the poor parishioners, they had mixed up the symbols. And when the church was restored, we left it exactly like that, leaving the mistake in the art just to show the people who built the church and their simplicity. Wow, there's something beautiful to that, to, to leaving it in, as a reminder of mm -hmm. a, a certain imperfection in the midst of a building that is so overwhelmingly beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And, was, and they were just simple people who just loved God and gave everything they had. We don't have any of their homes left, um, but they gave everything they had to build this church that we can enjoy it today wow. and see how great God is. That, that's incredible. One of the things that you're definitely going to see in a Catholic church are Stations of the Cross. Okay. And so these are 14 images that are usually on the wall of a Catholic church. So you can see 14 different images um, and they are all the story of Christ's passion on the way to the cross. Okay. These ones have Polish inscriptions. This one is, you know, Jesus meets his mother or Jesus falls on, on the cross. But the Stations of the Cross were just a way, it was a devotion that developed for people to relive Okay. Uh, Christ's sacrifice for us. So whether it's from, the, from him being condemned by Pilate all the way to him being buried in the tomb. So it goes around the, the church. They, they follow in, in order. Wow, that's yeah. really neat. There, there's no end to Catholic there, devotions. And... There isn't, but the whole building is communicating something and allowing people to understand, which is just a fascinating paradigm shift from what I grew up in, where it's how do we make people comfortable? How do we get them a nice coffee and get them checked in? And you know, nothing wrong with that per se, but there's just such a, a depth here that is really fascinating. I think it actually requires us to be children again. Yeah. You know, when you're a child and you walk in and everything's new and you're in awe, I think the same way too. The church is like, it's almost like a special atrium, which allows people to pray in different ways. So when you come in on a Sunday, somebody may be praying the station of the cross. Others are lighting candles. Others are praying in some small corner, but there's just a space where people can see the wonders of God's love for them in art, in, in beauty and in song and prayer. Wow. So. It's beautiful. One of my favorite things about um, this church, I have many, but are these two stained glass windows at the back of the church. If we look at this window here, which is the transfiguration, you're going to see Christ with Moses and Elijah. Oh, okay. And at the base are the three apostles, Peter, James, and John. Yes. Now, if we had experienced the transfiguration ourselves, we'd be tempted to think that we would never sin again and that we would never ever fall. But as we know, months later, that the, the transfiguration wasn't the full story. Why did Christ was transfigured to give them an image of himself so that, so that they could endure the cross? They had to go down into the valley. And so three months later, if we look to the other side, we find the same three apostles who are just standing on the mountain in awe and there they are asleep when Christ is in his agony. And that's a good reminder to us that no matter what experiences we have with God, that we still need to be held, held through. Yeah. And so whether we're in the mountaintop with Christ and it's amazing, or whether we are in the garden of agony and we are asleep and Christ asks us to be awake, but those are all part of the story. That's beautiful. Wow. And now, as a complete yeah, outsider, so... This is where you do confession. This is where we do confession. Okay. I remember growing up and when I heard about Catholics, I heard that they had a box, like a magic box, and you go in there and they turn on a green light and your sins are gone. That's the only thing I know about <laughs> confessions, but they are. And that's not it? <laughs> <laughs> it could be, but uh, no, of course, it's, it's a beautiful sacrament. What happens here? These are old confessions. Not all confessions are as old as, as this one, but... Uh, you do have the, the light which is on when the priest is there. Oh, okay. And these are closed. The priest sits inside. And when the, the priest sits there and the penitent or the person confessing goes to the side and they kneel down and they start with, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And they just say out, they say out loud, like James says, confess your sins one to another. They say out loud their sins mm. in a way that keeps them honest. The priest may give them some counsel. Uh, he may say, okay, you know, you should probably stay away from this or you should probably do that or whatever. Or he tells them how much they, they are loved by God. 
and then the most incredible thing happens. Just like at the altar, the priest in this moment, uh, Catholics believe, becomes in persona Christi, and he gives them the words of absolution where he says, mm -hmm. and I absolve you from your sins. He says, I absolve you, because at those moments, Christ is borrowing his lips, okay. and he's making the sign of the cross over them. And psychologists, many people in history have marveled at the effect of confession, that people will come here to these places, be honest, and they can let it go, and they walk away. Right. And of course, the great seal of confession, we've heard movies, there's been movies and stories about this, like Alfred Hitchcock, I Confess, for instance. Um, whatever is said to the priest in a confession can never, ever be said anywhere. The priest is in danger of being excommunicated for ever revealing what is heard wow. in the confession. Not even the Pope can ask me to reveal what somebody tells me in confession. So it's a most sacred seal over the confession that what is said there uh, stays there. So. I, I do have that beautiful, it's actually one of my favorite things to do, really? is to sit here and to hear people be honest with themselves because at that moment, you get to understand how much God loves them and impart to them how much they are loved in spite of themselves. Wow. And so I do love, I do love the sacrament of confession and people at this church use it readily. I mentioned we have 700 confessions on Sunday. That still amazes me. So, and priests have heard absolutely everything. Everything there is to hear, we've heard it all. So. But you can't tell me. That, I can't tell you, exactly. <laughs> wow. That so. has to be a weight, though, too, just hearing all of that. It, it is at times, but you would be surprised at how actually beautiful it is. Because yeah. when you see people at their worst, you also see them at their, at their best. And there are mm -hmm. moments where, uh, no, you don't feel the weight. You feel the weight of Christ's love for them. It's a strange experience. But, yeah. Um, I often, I think, after a full day of hearing confessions, you are a bit tired, but you're just more... Um, you're more just joyful because you know how many people God has forgiven and you get to watch over God's shoulders. Yeah. And that's really, really neat. That's beautiful. So, one of the beautiful things in this parish is, of course, the different works of art. And through this chapel, we actually have an experience of an artwork. And I'm sure you've caught a glimpse, but let's, um, let's go on in. And, yeah, and let's. One of the things you're going to notice is that when we head through these doors, we're leaving the Baroque and entering the Gothic. Okay. And so if you ever wanted to know the difference between Baroque and Gothic, you're going to experience that walking through these doors because we're leaving 18th century Krakow and heading into 14th century Krakow. Wow. So let's walk in. All right. This is a beautiful private chapel. It is a, a chapel that would have been used for devotional prayers, for other things, but today it houses this beautiful work of art. And this work of art, uh, like all art, has a purpose. The first is, of course, to glorify God, and the second is to teach us about the faith. So in the Middle Ages, obviously not everybody read. Only the clergy read or others knew how to read. But how did people learn the scriptures? How did they learn the Bible stories? They learned it through art. Right. And so in this artwork here, you're going to see an altarpiece, uh, which is teaching us the mysteries, whether it's Christ on the cross, his death for us. But it's a whole, really a pocket catechesis or a Bible. This is called the Vistvosh altarpiece, and it's one of the largest, it's the largest replica of the original altarpiece from St. Mary's Basilica in Krakow. Okay. This church is known as Little Krakow, and this is one of the reasons why. This altarpiece um, is, exists three times the size in, in Poland, but wow. this is an amazing replica, and it does open up. So it's not just a triptych, but it's a pentateuch. It has five panels. Okay. And so we're actually going to see inside. But one of the first things I'll show you as we come close, the secret to Gothic art is that all Gothic art moves from the bottom and goes up. Okay. So if we look down, we see the tree of Jesse. Now everything's carved very medieval because this is about 1472. So do you see Jesse lying there? Yes. In the book of Isaiah, a shoot shall come from Jesse, and the, all the kings, prophets, patriarchs, David, right, the whole lineage. And so there's the shoot shall come from Jesse, and so the, the, this is the beginning. Underneath the altar is the old covenant leading us to the New Testament. Wow. And so then, we, of course, we are brought into the mystery. Now, this is an example of being moved by beauty. Austin, I'm going to help you ask you to yes, take a... Uh, mm -hmm. Come up, yeah. So i ask you to take that and we'll... Wow. That's stunning. The power of art... Um, this is a lot, 
but this is a carved image of the death of Our Lady, the death of Mary. So the 12 apostles surrounding Mary in, in her death. And then you can see her assumption and way up top, her coronation into heaven. Wow. And all the other various scenes in the life of Jesus, Christ's resurrection, the descent of the, the uh, Pentecost, the, uh, the ascension, all these various scenes. So this altarpiece was the last thing our parishioners would have seen before leaving the city of Krakow and coming to Chicago. Oh, and so okay. this was done to honor them. Wow. But it does show the power of art, that art still moves people. Uh, to this day, I bring thousands of people through this chapel, and many of them do not even know God or know anything about, but the, the beauty of the art still moves them, and they can live, relive the gospel story. Wow, so that's, that's incredible. Now, it, it's interesting, just, just this is kind of an aside, but isn't it a bit of an open question among Catholics as to whether Mary died or was assumed just like without dying? Oh, wow, that's really great. <laughs> so yes, the Eastern Church holds that Mary had Mary's dormition. Okay. And the, but the Western Church holds that uh, she probably died. Okay. The dogma of the Assumption uh, doesn't say either. It says at the end of the course of her earthly life, Mary was assumed body and soul. Okay. So in Poland, which is between East and West, this might have been known as the Dormition of Our Lady. Okay. That's a very inside question. I'm very impressed by your knowledge of Marian dog dogmas and their intricacies in it. I try. I try. <laughs> I have to keep up with all of you guys. You guys are way smarter than me, and you keep me on my toes. Yeah, so yeah, Mary's Dormition, or Mary's death, her Assumption, her Coronation. Wow. These figures are not saints. Okay. These are the mayor and nobles of the city of Krakow, okay. the people who paid for the altarpiece. Huh. They paid one year's budget of the city to have this altarpiece done. Could you imagine wow. one year's budget of the city of Chicago for a work of art? Yeah. That's what happened in Krakow. In a church, yeah. I don't yeah. think uh, so. Mayor Light puts it proving that anytime soon. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> wow. But when this was first unveiled, um, it was unveiled by candlelight, and people saw, oh, uh, they saw the figures, and they were, imagine, by candlelight, they thought they had been witnessing something amazing, like an apparition, because the figures seemed to be dancing. So it was yeah. very, very moving. But again, the, the power of art that we don't just know God, but we also love God, that truth has to take a concrete form, right? Wow. The truth becomes flesh, the word becomes flesh, and that's what you see in, in Catholic art. Wow, that's beautiful. All right, so that's really one of the highest points of the tour. There's so much to see here. Um, the church is, it's an amazing treasure box, and you can take as much as you need. Yeah. Everything, you know, it's, um, the church is the house of God. It's where people's lives beginning, uh, they begin and end. Uh, people are married here, they are buried here. People are baptized here, and so people come in their greatest joys and their greatest sorrows, but, but the church really is just a place where, in concrete form, we can encounter God. Wow. And it's true. Um, we are a temple, that we can go to our closet, and we, we can pray ourselves, but the church helps us to be edified and to really encounter in a very real and tangible way the power and majesty of God. Wow. That, that is beautiful, and I feel like someone could do their PhD just on everything that's going on here. But it has been such a privilege getting to see so much of this. So thank you so much. Oh, it's been wonderful. And uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll be back and you'll see many other wonders. And certainly throughout the, the liturgical year, um, the, the seasons change and there's yeah. so much. But, um, but you're, you're always welcome. And certainly any of your viewers are always welcome to come see the beauty of this church or any other churches in your cities that I know are very beautiful. And I'm sure that kind priests would be able to explain and to give you a tour just like we gave you today. Yeah, just don't be disappointed when it's not as cool as Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Austin. It's yes. been, a, been, been a joy. Thank, Thank you, you so much. What a tour. Is that not like the coolest church building ever? I hope you learned a ton. I know I did. And if you want to see more videos like this, please let me know in the comments. One last time, thank you to Father Joshua Caswell, and thank you as well to my patron subscribers and merch buyers. And hey, real quick, the video's actually not over here. Well, this video is, but the fun continues because Father Joshua Caswell and I actually sat down for an interview after the tour, and that's gonna be coming out soon. And if you enjoyed this tour and you wanna learn more, I think you will really enjoy that interview, so be on the lookout for that. 
As always, this is Gospel Simplicity, and here on this channel, we're passionate about the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel. We're out to talk about life, Jesus, the journey of faith in a real, honest, and open way. So if that at all interests you, I'd really encourage you to hit subscribe down below to become a part of what we're doing. And if you wanna become a part of what we're doing at an even deeper level, if you wanna support this channel, I would encourage you to consider becoming a patron. Patrons, through their monthly generosity, make videos like this possible. If you're interested in that, click the link in the description down below. Until next time, be sure to be on the lookout for more videos, specifically that interview, and go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world. Peace. I love you guys so much, and I'll see you next time.